The romantic story of love tells us that our search for a partner is inspired above all else by a desire to find someone who can make us happy. But the truth is a little more confused and peculiar, for one of the oddest aspects of love is that in tracking down a mate, we don't in fact look out for just anyone who seems kind, good and attractive. We look out for someone who will fulfill a number of pre-existing psychological requirements, which could include a subterranean appetite for frustration and humiliation. We are constrained in our love choices by what we learnt of love as children. Adult love is, in central ways, a search for a rediscovery of emotions first known in childhood. In order to prove exciting and attractive, the partner we pick must re-evoke many of the feelings we once had around parental figures. And these feelings, though they may include tenderness and satisfaction, are also likely to feature a more troubling range of emotions. Perhaps a desire to prove ourselves to someone who was always slightly sceptical of us, or a feeling of shame around sexuality, or a need to cheer up someone with depressive tendencies. We can find ourselves rejecting certain candidates in adulthood, not so much because they are wrong, as because they feel a little bit too right. That is, we dimly intuit that they're not going to make us suffer in the ways we need to suffer in order to feel that love is real. The romantic view of love suggests that we end up in bad relationships by mistake. The psychological view suggests that we end up in tricky places by unconscious intent. Without being fully aware of our wish, we need our partner to have a failing that our parents once had, so that we can repeat the flawed but potent dynamic we once experienced as children. Though in most cases we're drawn to people with the very same failings as a parent, occasionally a relationship pays tribute to a parent's failings in a slightly different way. We act towards our partner as our parent once acted towards us. We push the partner into the role we once inhabited as a child. We may leave our partner uncertain of where they stand or deeply aware of their inadequacies. We may shout at their failures or complain of their inadequate performance in the eyes of the world. It seems we are fated either to seek out the fault of a parent in a partner or to mimic the fault of the parent with a partner. Either way, the fault of the parent remains central to our love choices. Without it, we may simply not be able to feel passionate or tender with someone. We might imagine we would only be attracted to admirable traits, to perfection, to very positive things about another. Yet just below the conscious radar, it is the failings that lure us in. Because we don't automatically see what we're doing, it can be helpful actively to try to compare past and present. For example, to reflect on how a parent made us feel and then to audit how we often feel around a partner. The correspondences can be as striking as they are humbling. If we become aware of the tricky scripts we're following to want to leave a relationship at once, but this implies that we might easily be able to overcome the sort of people we're attracted to. A less dramatic but still hopeful strategy is to try to deal more successfully with our compulsions within an existing relationship. What this involves is accepting the extent to which we're liable to be dealing with the issues in our couple with some of the immaturity of a child. The child we were when we first encountered the compelling flaws of our parents. We should feel sympathy for ourselves for facing a double challenge in love. We're attracted to adults who have some of the failings we knew in childhood, but then, in dealing with these failings, we have none of the resources, wisdom and competence that someone who'd enjoyed adequate parenting in relation to them would have been able to muster. The failings we're most attracted to become those we're least set up to deal with. We love a slightly distant person, but we can't deal with the silences. We're drawn to free spirits, but we can't deal with the attendant anxieties. In other words, our emotional legacy doesn't just involve an attraction to certain failings, it also involves a style of responding to these failings that's stuck at the level of traumatized childhood, and typically involves panic, terror, cold withdrawal, projection, shame, and obsessive rigidity. We should undertake an unusual thought experiment to imagine the responses that an ideal, mature person might display in relation to the challenges we face. 
we should imagine what the mature person might do in relation to a partner who was often working, or who made them feel ashamed of sex, or whose career was in decline. A mature person wouldn't be pleased or unfazed, but they would have the inner skills to navigate the rocks calmly. They would resist jealous rages or silent sulks. They would know how to wait for the right moment to deliver a point. They might have the inner freedom to make a joke out of a problem. They wouldn't have to crush a weaker party. Keeping such possibilities in our minds helps us to see that our own instinctive responses aren't necessary or normal. They are the responses of people who underwent a lot of trouble before they had any idea of how to cope with it. We should create a zone of possibility in which we can regularly imagine having a different and more constructive response to our partner's oddities. We should accept that the way to have a better relationship is likely to lie not in firing the partner, we are with them for tricky but firm reasons, but in doing some internal work to learn better how to cope with the problems we face with them. We can come to accept that being uncomplicatedly happy in love was never going to be our leading psychological possibility, given our childhoods, but that we may gradually learn to make our peace with character traits in our partners that are as troublesome as they are compelling.